Good afternoon. Uh, we stand between you and the fabulous um, gala tonight, so um, um, we will try to be entertaining and informative. Um, while one of our panelists gets mic'd up, I will, I will get the panel started. My name is Pavi Alal. I work at the Science and Technology Policy Institute, which is a federally funded research and development center that was created by Congress to support the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. We also work with other space agencies. Uh, today we will be talking in this panel on on-orbit uh, servicing, assembly, and manufacturing. Um, before, before I introduce our panelists, uh, I should mention that we actually are, are starting a new project on global trends, in, and I'm just going to use this abbreviation, OSAM, on-orbit servicing, assembly, and manufacturing, just OSAM. Um, so um, um, I would love to talk to as many of you as possible after the session and tomorrow. Um, so um, uh, what is OSAM, just to kind of get the uh, discussion started? Um, the servicing is typically defined as on-orbit alteration of a satellite after its initial launch using another spacecraft to conduct these alterations. And it could be things like refueling, which uh, Daniel is going to talk about. Assembly involves the on-orbit aggregation of components to constitute a spacecraft, and manufacturing refers to on-orbit transformation of raw materials into usable spacecraft components, and I think uh, Rob is going to talk about uh, maybe a little bit of both of those. Um, and but, but the uh, core question is why do we care about OSAM? And the reason for that is that when you launch a fully assembled spacecraft from Earth, there are some significant limitations on the size, volume, and design of the spacecraft. Three in particular uh, I would like to draw your attention to. The first one is that the spacecraft itself needs to be accommodated as a payload in the fairing of a single launch vehicle, and the volume of which may restrict the size and the number of instruments, for example, that could be included. The second one is components must be ruggedized to withstand the harsh launch environment, which imposes penalties in, with respect to mass and size, limiting payload capabilities and increasing complexity, test, test time and cost. Uh, one example that um, a colleague of mine gave me is that you know a spacecraft's life is maybe you know in, in geo 15 more years, mm -hmm. and most of the design of the spacecraft is for the first eight minutes of its life, which is launch, which kind of seems ridiculous, right? Uh, the third, uh, uh, last but not least, the the backups and redundancies must be included in spacecraft because uh, there might be contingencies against uh, against which they you know these very expensive uh, uh, spacecraft must be. Uh, must be protected, and this could be damaged during launch or failure on orbit. Um, uh, with that, I would like to introduce our a very exciting panel today, um, and um, uh, let me quickly say a few words on each of them, and then I would like each of the panelists to maybe spend five minutes talking about what they believe you all need to know about OSAM, and then I have some questions prepared, and I'm hoping you all have, would have some questions as well. So I would like first Dan Farber, Dan or Daniel? Daniel. Daniel Farber uh, to go. He's a co-founder and CEO, CEO of Orbit Fab. And Daniel would paint a vision for us on what the space economy looks like with OSAM uh, in any way that you wish to, to tell us. Uh, next, I would like Rob Hoyt to go. Uh, Rob is the CEO of uh, Tethers Unlimited. And Rob will focus on exciting technologies related to space-based manufacturing on the horizon, but you know, your call. Uh, third, I would like Stephanie Roy, who is a partner at Perkin Coy, right? You Perkins told me how. Perkins yeah. Per Perkins Coy. Um, Stephanie will bring us down on Earth and address key legal issues and regulatory challenges we need to overcome to promote OSAM. And last but not least, we have Ian Christensen, who is the Director of Private Sector Programs at the Secure World Foundation. And, uh, and Ian will give us an update on standards and best practices uh, from an industry perspective. With that, I would like to turn it to Daniel for about five minutes of his overview. Sure. Do you want to come to the podium? Um, sure. Are there uh, some slides, or what do we have? So, uh, yeah, Orbit Fab is, is building gas stations in space. We see the the problem on orbit that uh, all the satellites at the moment are not reusable. So, um, a bit of a uh, Great, a bit of a uh, artistic impression of what a gas station might look like in space. 
But this is what the future is that, that we're all building. There's a lot of people investing in this. We heard from OneWeb, they're putting up a, a thousand odd satellites. There are other companies. You know, we've had 12,000 satellites authorized in the last year. I, I think the number might be up to 14,000 now. So space is about to become a bustling place. Um, we have rockets that are, are now reusable. And uh, however, this is what space is like right now. You don't touch the satellites, you, you launch them and you leave them there and you move them as little as possible. And uh, once you're, you've paid for that satellite and put it in orbit, it's, it's done. That's the maximum flexibility that you have. You've lost all flexibility over your business model. You just leave it there. And when you run out of fuel, you've got to get it out of orbit. Or if it fails, it's, a, it's junk. When we look at other assets that have a similar lifetimes, we're refueling those quite often. We're reusing them quite often. Even rockets are getting reused. We live in a world now where, I guess, SpaceX has done three. We like to see that number increase quite a lot. But satellites are still not reusable. They're disposable. They're, they're junk after they're done. That's all we can do. That's the world that we're trying to change. And there's, there's that pain created by, by having to rebuild your assets and pay for that. And um, I'll just try here. Um, so there's a lot of companies now building these satellite servicing vehicles. And, uh, and that's where you know, this on-orbit servicing, manufacturing, assembly starts to come in. How can we add flexibility to these business models? There's one thing that uh, OrbitFab came in and said, well, all of those are going to need fuel because even your tow trucks will run out of fuel. There's only so much you can carry. If you want to refuel the satellite, you have to then uh, take that, that fuel out of the, the servicing vehicle's uh, uh, tanks and you will, you will run out of fuel. So that's where we come in. We looked at this supply chain and said, there's a problem with this. Uh, none of these parts here are designed to be refueled. The satellite is built uh, by, by satellite integrators. The operators get their spacecraft from the integrators. And these spacecraft are designed to be um, very highly tuned. You have to make sure you make the most of the space you have in the launch vehicle. There's not a lot of space to put in extra systems to be uh, refueled, upgraded, and changed. And they're buying components from subsystem manufacturers who haven't designed these components to be upgraded, modified, changed, refueled. And on the propellant side, they're buying sub-subsystems. The fueling ports, again, have not been designed to be upgraded, manufactured, or changed. So how do we change this? How do we start small and work our way into making this future compatible? So at OrbitFab, we said the biggest problem for refueling is that the fueling ports aren't made to be refueled in orbit. Let's do that. Let's build a fueling port and let's start to change this whole cycle. And that fueling port has to be the same size, the same mass, the same function, the same price as a fueling port. And that way you'll get it into the spacecraft and be able to change things. So that's the first thing we built. We did some tests on the International Space Station with various technologies. We then built our prototypes. We worked with uh, 20, 25 customers, you know, potential users of this, all the way through the, uh, the value chain and said, what do, we, what do we need to hit in terms of performance? And now we've produced a, a product that's being shipped to customers. And that service valve that you see on the right there, that, that small piece, it is the same size, weight, cost, as a, uh, a fill drain port that you put on a traditional satellite right now. So that's commercial product that's available. It's going through life testing right now. We expect to be flying that uh, in a few months. Other things that we've done, testing the pumps, the, plum the, the pumps, the plumbing, the valves, the feed systems uh, on board the International Space Station. So we've tested zero G propellant transfer. This is nothing new, but what this is is a product. The smallest tanker there, the, the, the rigid tanker on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the right, that's a 16 unit CubeSat. That's the smallest that we could imagine that you would build a tanker. We put solar arrays and flight avionics on that, and that's our free-flying operational tanker. That should be flying next year. So this stuff is coming. We want to run by the end of next year a full fuel sale uh, trial, <coughs> transferring propellant between a tanker and a customer. So I'm also going to use this as, uh, to make an announcement. OrbitFab today we're announcing we got into the Techstars program with Starburst. The companies listed at the bottom there are the, the supporting companies on that program. All of those companies chose OrbitFab and, and the other companies in the programs because they specifically wanted to do business with them, because they recognized that this is coming. So all the large companies are seeing it, the government agencies are seeing it, they're now starting to write this into their plans. So we're seeing a huge amount of change. And it's partly because you know, we've been able to do small innovative things, but it's mostly because there are now, we're tracking 25 companies, sorry, as of yesterday, 26 companies that are building the satellite servicing spacecraft. We build big tanks of gas. We, we are the gas station. It's the satellite servicing spacecraft, those tow trucks that come to us, 
that do the, the complex robotics, that do the proximity operations and docking. Those are the companies that have really forced a lot of change in that, and we're just a layer of infrastructure. So that's sort of the Orbit Fab story and how we fit into this picture. Rob's got, uh, uh, of course, a, uh, a lot of things he's been doing on the servicing side, so I think it's a great follow. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm Rob Hoyt. I'm CEO of Tethers Unlimited. We are a small but growing company located here in the Seattle area. Uh, and if you've been following us for any amount of time, you probably know that we work on a large number of different technologies. Um, and I'd like to give a little bit of perspective on why we're working on those different technologies. Everything we're doing is geared towards helping to create a vibrant and sustainable economy in space. Uh, but that's a long-term vision, so what we're doing is taking an incremental approach working towards that goal. We've started out by developing a handful of component technologies for small satellites, focusing on very high performance in a small volume to enable CubeSats and NanoSats to perform operationally relevant missions. Uh, and we've now got those products on orbit and in production, uh, software-defined radios. We've got a thruster that uses water as propellant, uh, gimbals and deorbit mechanisms. Those are on orbit and flight proven. And our focus on that part of the business is in scaling up our production capabilities and quality assurance to meet the needs of some of the constellations that are being developed now. The next market that we're working to uh, develop is the satellite services and really the hosted payload market. And what we're doing there is developing a new small sat platform that is really built from the ground up to uh, minimize the cost, minimize the time, and streamline the whole process for customers to get their payloads integrated onto the satellite and also streamline the on-orbit operations for those customers. Uh, that's a platform called Hyperbus, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. Um, but more in longer term, more interesting is that we're also designing that small satellite bus to serve as the building block for assembling larger, high-performance, high-reliability systems on orbit. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but to do that, we need robotic systems that can take modules assemble them together, build other components, integrate them all together to make functioning space systems. So we're also working to develop a robotic servicing vehicle, small, low-cost robotic servicing vehicle called Leo Knight. Um, so the, the Hyperbus system <clears throat> is in development now, and we're looking for uh, booking initial customers. So if you have a small payload that begin, can be integrated into a 10U volume or smaller, uh, we'd love to talk with you. We're, we're working towards very frequent launch opportunities and very affordable end-to-end -end services where you deliver us the payload and we get it integrated and on orbit and operating very quickly. Uh, so. Okay, so Hyperbus, um, it's built around our components, our so swift software-defined radios, our hydro thruster, which again uses water as propulsion, and we intend to make these refuelable on orbit uh, and a precision pointing mechanism called the Cobra Gimbal. And as I said, it's designed to really streamline the experience for the payload customer. Um, so minimizing the need to, or eliminating the need for each customer to develop their own satellite and minimizing our need to customize the satellite for every payload. So we're standardizing the payload interface and instead of making the satellite customizable, it will be readily configurable with a few op two optional modules that can provide orbit agility, so a little bit of delta V, so you can maneuver to the orbit you want to be in, as well as high bandwidth data uplink and downlink, so we can get big data down from your, from your small satellite uh, payload. Um, so that, this is in development now. We've got funding to start the development. And again, if you have, have, have a small payload or, or want to get a satellite business up and running, please talk to us. Uh, and then to be able to take these modules and build them into larger systems and provide other in-space services such as in-space assembly, in-space manufacturing, and in-space servicing such as refueling or repair of small satellites, 
Uh, we're working with the Air Force Research Lab and several other organizations to put together a robotic, a, a small sat robotic servicing capability. Um, it's going to be similar in concept to the big systems that uh, DARPA and NASA are developing, such as Restore-L and RSGS. But because those big systems are so large and, and relatively expensive, the economics don't trade well for assembly of small modular systems. So we're developing this Microsat class uh, robotic servicing vehicle to achieve the low cost needed to make um, in-orbit assembly really economically competitive for many missions. And this is built around, enough, this, this isn't just PowerPoint, um, we've got a, a compact robotic arm called the Kraken that we've been developing for a while. Um, that'll be a key element. We'll of course use the water-based thruster so it's refuelable and we can deliver water or other propellant to other to client spacecraft. Uh, and it also integrates um, high bandwidth data communications capabilities and uh, connectors and servicing tools to enable it to capture and service other small satellites. Uh, so th those are just a few of the things that we're working on. But as I said, they're all geared towards being able to stand up in space services to help create and drive a vibrant in space economy. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, contrary to popular belief, uh, the lawyer's job is not to bring you back down to earth. The lawyer's job is to try to help get you where you want to go. So my shtick up here is to tell folks to involve your lawyers or your regulatory counsel early in the process because there are things to put in place that we need to have in place before the tech is ready to, to do the exciting things that my panelists uh, are working their way toward being able to do um, that's not yet in place. Uh, we've heard a lot today about the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. That treaty places liability for space objects with the nation states. The nation states and then um, create their own, own relationships with their private actors. Uh, but on a nation state to nation state basis, our governments are liable to each other um, for things that happen as a result of objects launched into space. This has a flow down effect on uh, the regulatory environment in which we function and then subsequently on the uh, agreements that we sign with other private actors to help uh, make our business uh, objectives a reality. It's like, a, it's like Russian dolls, right? You've got um, our, our, our private sector to private sector agreements, the private sector uh, state actor agreements or regulatory conditions or licenses, what, however you choose to um, paper up that relationship and then you've got the state to state relationships. So right now the only handshakes you've had between two different objects in space have belonged to the same government or two government actors working pursuant to a bilateral multilateral agreement. Here we're talking with the exciting in space propellant depots, on orbit servicing, uh, one commercial actor touching another commercial actor's um, stuff up there in space. So the question is, you know, who, whose space object is that while those two vehicles are in conne connected to each other? Whose fault is it if something happens during those operations, for example? I don't know if we have this answered yet. Uh, and the answer, the resolution uh, can either be ad hoc, a bilateral exchange of letters between the launching state for one object with the launching state for the other object, the satellite and the satellite um, servicing or, or uh, de uh, propellant depot launching state. Or it could be uh, multilateral, maybe uh, the, the states that are currently active and launching objects into space actually kind of get together and come to a set of agreements and principles that they apply and then trickle down to their uh, private actors. But this is something that needs to happen, and we'd like to see it happen sooner rather than later, or at least have the players uh, poised to um, put these agreements and understandings in place such that the private sector can get on with the business of operating uh, in space uh, in as innovative a way as, as they can, and without having to wait once the tech is ready for the licensing process to, 
to run its course. And that's one of the biggest, I think, um, challenges that needs to be addressed in the space. But there are others as we look farther term. And I think, you know, in orbit fueling and satellite servicing uh, are some of the near term, um, nearer term uh, opportunities in this space. On orbit manufacturing, there is another. There's the question of how are the intellectual property laws applied in space? If something is being added to manufactured in space, where is that invented? What's the place of invention? Is it the, you know, there's a, there's some precedent to look to uh, in the uh, uh, Outer Space Treaty, but it's not definitive. And I, I think um, for people doing exciting things and valuable things in space, they want a little bit more certainty. Um, and all of that kind of trickles down from your licensing to then your private agreements. Right, you're, when you're launching things into space, you typically need to get insurance. Your insurance, you know, your agreements with your insurance and companies are going to depend upon what your licensing requirements are and what your liability exposure is, on how much perhaps the government's covered for you, like the um, government covers under the Commercial Space Launch Act. So, so that's really all I wanted to say. It's just, it's an exciting um, area. Uh, the lawyer is your friend. Um, uh, not somebody that just sits there and tells you you can't do something. They're there to tell you uh, and to, to how, to, how you can best do it um, within the constraints and within the avenues of advocacy that we have available to us. Um, so go forth and innovate. All right, uh, good afternoon everyone. Again, uh, Ian Christensen with uh, the Secure World Foundation, although today I'm here to talk to you about uh, work we're doing with uh, an industry group uh, through which Secure World and others serves as the, the secretariat for, and that is uh, the Consortium for Execution of Rendezvous and Servicing Operations, a uh, government-derived uh, acronym, so you can thank the government for that uh, slightly clumsy acronym as we refer to it, uh, CONFERS. Um, so CONFERS is a group of uh, industry uh, actors in the uh, broad servicing and rendezvous and proximity operations segment that is looking to develop standards and best practices to enable this, uh, this set of activities. And there we go. Um, so we, uh, within CONFERS, we really do view uh, satellite servicing, rendezvous and proximity operations as a cornerstone for the growing future space economy that Daniel referenced at the beginning of this, uh, at this talk. And we want to uh, facilitate a conversation with an industry forum about how standards, best practices, and shared information can enable that, uh, that, that future and those capabilities of on-orbit servicing and rendezvous and proximity operations. So CONFERS is initially supported by DARPA, uh, the Fed's Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, but in typical DARPA fashion, it's been, uh, maturing over the next few years into an industry-supported activity. We are an ind independent industry forum to advocate, promote, uh, advocate and promote on-orbit satellite servicing and rendezvous and proximity operations, collaborate to develop, re to develop and publish voluntary consensus best practices and standards for OOS and RPO, and uh, to engage with governments uh, on the policy and regulatory aspects of satellite servicing. Uh, so I see here, I put up here um, the current members of the CONFERS group. Um, it's actually a slide that's slightly out of date already. We've had two new members join in the last week. I uh, haven't been able to update the, the slide. Um, what I want to highlight here is the, the breadth of this activity. If you look across this slide, you have companies almost across the entire um, space value chain. We have uh, servicing providers, a couple of those companies represented on the stage here. Uh, today we have uh, satellite manufacturers, we have satellite operators, we have robotic system vendors, we have space situational awareness vendors, and we have um, enabling uh, services uh, companies such as some uh, insurers and, 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 and some companies such as uh, Aerospace Corporation. So again, uh, servicing activities, rendezvous and proximity activities involve a uh, broad breadth and, and scope of, uh, of companies. We also take into account a large breadth of scope of activities. So we, uh, in CONFERS, consider everything from satellite inspection, uh, refueling and life extension, satellite end of life operations, so deorbiting, uh, active debris removal, and modular satellite assembly and uh, in orbit assembly, uh, as was talked about already on this panel. Uh, CONFERS is considering uh, standards and best practices, really focusing in our first phase on risk management and safety of flight uh, and mission assurance, looking at uh, things such as interfaces, operational practices, data exchange and sharing, and transparency, public information sharing around on-orbit servicing and RPO operations. Uh, we've published uh, thus far two documents, uh, our 
what we call our guiding principles for RPO and on, or on orbit servicing. Again, these are industry consensus uh, documents to cover things such as consensual operations, compliance with relevant laws, responsible and transparent operations. We've also published a more detailed document, our design and operating principles, focusing entirely on mission, uh, mission assurance. They include design principles, they include operations to avoid uh, mishaps principles, they talk about avoiding interference, uh, and they talk about uh, promoting sustainability of, of operations. So, so those documents are available on the, uh, the consortium website. Uh, the group is continuing to work and, and deepen those over the next uh, several months and, and ongoing. Uh, both of those documents have been referred to the International Standards Organization, uh, which is an international body that develops consensus standards. Uh, that referral is to start an international conversation around standards and best practices for on-orbit servicing and rendezvous and proximity operations. Uh, and with that, I think I'll wrap up. Again, we're open to membership from uh, anyone in the non-governmental on-orbit servicing and RPO uh, interest area. So thank you. Those were four really excellent uh, opening statements. Um, I, uh, we have about 20-ish minutes. I would like to ask a few questions of our panelists and then I would like to open the floor. So please do think of questions. Uh, my first question actually is for Daniel. Um, uh, um, I live in this world of innovation policy where there is sort of the tech push and the mission pull concept. And I have heard some folks say, you know, to what o degree is OSAM sort of an ooh shiny? You know, we have this great new tool, a new technology. Let's try to find a way to integrate it, sort of the, the tech push approach. But, you know, thinking from the mission pull approach, I mean, in the, if, you, if you look out 10 years, what are the sorts of scenarios do you see? How, does, how do architectures change? Because we have this amazing capability to refuel spacecraft or assemble in space or, or manufacture in space. What, what, what are the scenarios you see in the next 10 years? Yeah, the great thing about technology change is uh, in 10 years, there'll be things that we don't expect. Um, but the things that, that we are looking at in, uh, in shorter time frames, I guess, um, and really we, we came at this at Orbit Fab because of the, the pain points that we saw trying to design a spacecraft where you have to fit all of the fuel and the thruster and the power supply, if it's electric propulsion, everything else, into a satellite that everybody's trying to make smaller and smaller. You're in this fight against, uh, against uh, you know, specific impulse and, and everything else. Uh, and it's always a challenge trying to fit more into, into what you can put on a rocket. The reason, of course, is rockets are not cheap and they're not going to get cheap. They're not going to get very cheap very quickly. There's a, there's a nice progression. But there's always that, that conflict. So to solve that pain, to be able to do more with your asset and be able to, to have a long and a life and a, and a flexible utility to it, you really want to start being able to refuel, being able to, to service, change parts out, all those types of things. And I think that's exactly what we'll see. So we've mapped out uh, five or six use cases for, for satellite servicing, uh, and of course in our case how uh, refueling and a propellant supply uh, plays into that. But uh, you know, some of those have been mentioned, um, active debris deorbit, um, you know, being able to, to solve some of the problems that, uh, for example, OneWeb uh, are looking at, uh, at you know, what are the failure rates of satellites, how do you get satellites out that, that don't last till the end of their lifetime, and how do you keep orbit the, the orbits clear of, of those assets. Once you have propellant in orbit, you can flip that paradigm around and say, let's just plan to deorbit every single one of them. So let's run them to the end of their propellant life and then deorbit them. In fact, let's plan to top them up. But, but more than planning for that, you get the flexibility to do that if you just take a fueling port. You have to take a fueling port anyway. Take one that can be, can be serviced on orbit. So now you've got yourself instant flexibility on your business plan that you can run it out of fuel and deorbit it, or you can extend the life. And uh, you know, show me a constellation where the upgrade hasn't been a few years late in this industry. Right? That always happens. You always want that flexibility, and you've never had it. The best we're able to do is to constrain the operations as much as possible and try and eke out the life of that asset and run it in slightly degraded modes. So that's just one example of, of the flexibility that you get from being able to have fuel in orbit. Once you can change out payloads and, and do such things, you start looking at uh, immortal satellite platforms. Because the thing that, that uh, everybody is building disposable satellites for is because Moore's law is starting to apply to, to spacecraft, to communications payloads and the like. You want to be able to, to ride that improvement. Well, let's throw the satellite out, build a new satellite. The main thing that's changed is the transponder that's on the satellite. 
if we have a platform and the wheels are still good, the tanks are still good, the thrusters are still good, the structure is still good, just throw the whole thing out and build it because the payload has to be replaced. If you just have to launch a box of payloads and, and plug them in because you've got that capability, everything changes. If you can 3D print the antennas, everything changes. If you can refuel that, you've got an immortal platform that you can just constantly upgrade. And now the, the question comes, well, how small is that? How big is that? What does that look like? We've designed our systems to be compatible with CubeSats. We believe that if you come in at that bottom end and you're able to service something as small as a 12U you know, CubeSat, um, possibly even a 6U CubeSat, it's easier to scale up than it is to scale down. It's also easier to start doing these things and entering the market and making those changes. And I think that's what we'll see. Folks that are building small satellites will take some of these risks. And while you might say, oh, for the smaller satellites, the marginal improvement of having propellant, of having you know, exchangeable payloads and things is smaller, that's just great. That just means as soon as we solve the problem at that scale, it'll accelerate until the larger platforms become you know, permanent, per permanent platforms with with a lot of uh, interchangeability and a lot of flexibility, serviced by attendant spacecraft, uh, constantly replenished with new technologies, with consumables, and, uh, and completely changing the way that we operate that. Um, the final aspect is, is perhaps uh, to look at launch. At the moment, we launch into to Sun Synchronous, we launch into, into Equatorial. We put up with the fact that our launch vehicles are neither polar nor equatorial, um, and so we have to, to launch at different angles from launch sites. If you have a large amount of propellant on orbit, you launch the maximum mass that you can on a rocket, and you meet it up with a, a uh, propellant store in orbit, and now you can, uh, can loft more mass in a world where propellant is not your driving factor, where you've got a supply of propellant. You can do inclination changes. You can do things that previously everyone's been terrified of doing. And so long term, I expect that um, you know, the launch sites in, in Florida are just going to drive everybody to launch to exactly 20, 28 and a half degrees. There'll be a very large supply of propellant there that you simply meet up with, and you go everywhere in the universe that you want from right over the launch site. That's, uh, that's a, a change in how we're going to operate. Certainly a great vision. Rob, do you have anything to add to that? Any, any aspects that Daniel may have missed? <coughs> I think he hit a lot of what I would say. I, I think that, you know, I, I agree with you that Right now, there's the risk for in-space manufacturing and servicing to be kind of the shiny object that we and a bunch of other folks are interested in. Um, and for it to really become adopted, there needs to be a compelling mission need for it. Um, but I think that there are some compelling problems in the industry that this new approach can solve. For example, right now, the, the geosatcom market is in crisis because you know, they put up their satellites and they need to operate them for 15 years to make the money back. Um, meanwhile, the terrestrial data services are evolving super rapidly and running ahead of them. Uh, but if those geo satellites can be architected so that they could affordably replace the payloads, upgrade the payloads every five years or so, um, and they could, say, 3D print antennas on orbit or do other things to be able to improve the, uh, the dollars per bit performance of those platforms, then I think that those, those geo-operators can stay competitive with the other data <coughs> service alternatives. Um, so, you know, I think w we, we in this industry trying to create these in-space services need to look for those key problems in the industry and figure out ways to apply the, the shiny toys that we're working on to, to solving those real problems. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't mean to say shiny to toys aren't cool. I'm all about shiny oh, I, toys. I love shiny toys. <laughs> <laughs> I bought and built the, the, both the Lego the kits, the Saturn V <laughs> and the uh, Lem. So all about toys. Um, Stephanie, moving on to you. Um, you mentioned a whole a bunch of areas where government needs to do some things. You know, there's liability issues, you know, alignment with the Outer Space Treaty. What are the two or three things that the government needs to do in the near term to start to make some of these visions that we just heard about come to fruition? I, I think the key one is, uh, in, in, you, know, you know, I think they've already started along this path of thinking about it um, and discussing it, uh, perhaps informally, with their counterparts internationally, uh, is how do you handle the um, meeting up of two different space objects from two different launching? administrations. And um, I, I think the first ones will probably be a letter agreement between the two administrations. Uh, but 
I, I think they, um, industry needs to make sure that they're engaged um, with, with the folks uh, in, in the government to make sure that the conversation is taking place and you know, in the context that they need it to take place, and with the realities of what the technical realities are, how you know, what the risk profiles are of the approach and um, the intercept, and uh, how long they're going to be uh, one object as opposed to two objects, and in and in order not to stand in these guys' way, um, that conversation needs to be going now and be in a place to to put in an agreement at least for the first mission or two within the next couple of years I'd say uh, but it will be those first agreements will be driven by an individual requirement like uh, at least one of these guys you know in orbit unit is gonna be exploring a contract to actually perform a service and, and meet up with another craft in orbit and they're gonna go uh, to um, the government reps and say, how do we do this? How do we make sure that this has happened? It's not just an agreement between the commer two commercial operators, because as soon as uh, one of us comes and says, you know, I'm going to hook up with, uh, you know, an Indian, you know, an Indian satellite to refuel it or something, India's going to go, whoa, 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 you're going to touch my stuff? You know, I don't think so, unless the government stakeholders are involved in understanding the parameters uh, around that interaction. Thank you. Um, Ian, uh, you spend a lot of time with companies both in the United States and, and around the world. What do you hear, or what is in your view, what are some of the things that can either derail the vision that we just heard about or accelerate it? Like, what are, what are your, what are some of the streams of thinking you, you hear? Yeah, so first I have to put a plug in for Confers. We're doing just what you were talking about, Excellent. Stephanie. So most of our workshops we've had, US regulators, European regulators, Japanese regulators, not got to India quite yet, but uh, maybe put that put that to the list. So you, you're exactly right. Those kind of conversations do need to happen. The regulators need to be aware of what plans industry have and be able to think about those moving into into the, the licensing yeah. government to government and, and ready to ready to come act. to an right. agreement. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So so that's, a, that's just to kind of echo that point. Um, one of the biggest issues on the policy side that we've seen come up um, has been a licensing function called near-Earth imaging. Um, so uh, Diane Howard mentioned the, the commerce efforts to reform the remote sensing regulations right now that are, that are going on. Um, and that's great. It's in, they're trying to increase the speed of the licensing process. They're trying to institute a presumed approval process instead of a more um, you know, prove-yourself-based process. Um, but the, the US regs have something called uh, non-Earth imaging. So if you're, you're capable of conducting remote sensing of a object in space from another space object, you have to get a Department of Commerce license to do that, right? Um, that licensing process right now has a number of restrictions in it that are seen to be fairly restrictive to on-orbit servicing capabilities. Uh, there's a 30-day notice period that you have to uh, get approval from the Secretary of Commerce for. So if you're going to do an anomaly inspection that's sort of an on-demand need, that's a problem. Um, there are uh, bands that they're considering on certain wavelengths that would uh, limit the uh, infrared sensors and, and radar sensors from being used um, in certain contexts. Uh, that limits both certain con ops and certain safety measures. Um, and there's also uh, some restrictions that relate to uh, space-based SSA capabilities that we were concerned about. So that sort of conversation is something that we hear from our members. We've put out a, a response to the Commerce NPRM and are engaging with the government on that. So that's one area where we see um, some need for further work in the, in the licensing regime. Um, on the opportunity side of the question, um, technical support from the, from the government agencies. So um, a lot of our companies have initial agreements with either NASA or with their um, um, corresponding space agency in their home nation to help do some early tech development and early uh, on-orbit demonstration type missions. And that's a very useful function. We'd like to see that, that continue as well. Actually, just to pull on that thread a bit, um, so uh, we've done two studies on on-orbit servicing assembly and manufacturing, and, and we try to do an inventory of you know, how much government support is going into OSAM. And I don't remember, uh, I think off the top of my head about you know, across DARPA, NASA, and other places, unclassified, it's about $50 million a year that the US government spends on this really important area. If you had a magic wand, and this is a question for anybody, you know, about how much do you think we need to be investing 
and how much should come from the government versus from the private sector. And again, you know. Oh, a specific number. That's <laughs> well, you know, I mean, is it like, are we, are we, we're, we're in the tens of millions from the government, and I don't know how much of, you know, there's really not that great account from the VC world. Are we, should we be, I mean, are, in order for us to meet this vision, are we looking at hundreds of millions, billions of dollars? Like, what is the, you know, there's NASA in the room. Uh, there's probably others in the room. Define support, though. I yeah. mean, there's research money going toward it, or you know, money put toward the regulatory issues. There also could be acting as a customer for the yeah. services. That's another way of support using anchor tendency con concepts. Um, it, it's, I don't know if I could put a number, you know, I think we'd like an order of magnitude more, but I, I don't know how your original numbers are. Confirmed. Right, so, so actually, so I do mean sort of upfront tech development, the sorts of things Ian was talking about, but also customer base, but so maybe not regulation because that's hard to put a number on. Yeah, we, we need to start flying and demonstrating these mm -hmm. capabilities, and that, that does get us in, you know, being able to demonstrate multiple of these capabilities likely, get us, likely gets us into the 100 million, 200 million class, but uh, I don't think that should just be just a te tech demo. Um, that should be uh, working with cli clients yeah. in, in the government and on the commercial side, uh, and, and ideally working as kind of public-private partnership mm -hmm. um, to to push some of these technologies in into the market. So I, yeah, I think on the um, on the customer side, I and mean, if you look at the the amount of money that's spent globally manufacturing, designing satellites, it's uh, it's something around thirty billion dollars, um, and. Uh, how much of that is going to transition to being in-orbit assembly type work and in-orbit uh, manufacturing type work? Uh, it may be a, a decent percentage of that. So in terms of uh, a customer, how much of the government is that 30 billion? I think it's about two thirds. Uh, how much then is the government likely to come to the party with as a customer for on-orbit servicing? A couple of billion mm -hmm. per year. Um, wouldn't surprise me at all in, uh, in the five, 10 year time frame. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that I think is just inevitable as the capabilities come to bear on the problems that, um, that everybody's trying to solve. And, and uh, So that's, that's on the customer side, and I'd encourage the, um, the, the government and, and commercial companies to look at uh, what can be done and then get engaged in helping to establish that for their own benefit. Uh, on ter in terms of uh, how much money up front, how much R&D perhaps is to spend, uh, as an entrepreneur, I, I get obsessed about minimum viable products and how to bring things to market and how to slash the capex out of things. Um, Orbit Fab needs $5 million of equity funding. That's it. Um, whereas all the, all the things that I'd seen before about on-orbit propellant depots called for hundreds of millions. Mm -hmm. So what we've been able to do is, is really figure out how we can get to this market without needing a lot of capital. Now, where's that capital come from? Um, yeah, it could be equity. Um, it could be debt if we had contracts. Mm -hmm. Uh, it could be government funding, love non-diluted funding, that's great. Um, but it's a, you know, in the scheme of things, an incredibly modest amount of funding. And that's because of how we've designed the business. And you know, I'm, I'm sure Rob has, has his way of funding what he's doing. The other, the other 25 satellite servicing companies that we're talking with have their own way of, uh, of achieving that uh, and getting through those funding milestones. So what can the, can the government do? Well, the government likes to spend bigger dollars on, on bigger things. Uh, there's, there's money going into cryogenics. We're avoiding cryogenics, for example. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different things that, that will play into how this evolves. Uh, as you put money into different capabilities, there are different quantities of, of money that uh, are required and different capabilities that, that that creates. So every entrepreneur is going to choose their own path, and, uh, and so you can't put a specific number on it. But yeah, for, for Orbit Fab, it's single digit millions, and uh, we're looking at all avenues to bring in that capital. Sounds great. Well, with that, I would like to open up the floor for questions. Um. It seems to me that something would really open the floodgates for all these businesses in this field would be to capture an asteroid and put it around the Earth. Can you start by saying your name? And oh, sure. Uh, Phil Swan from the Atlantis Project. So, yeah, so this idea of capturing an asteroid or bringing some kind of large resource close to Earth so you guys can all take advantage of it to do kinds of businesses oh, yeah, you want to do way. would be huge, I assume. Um, none of you are going to be able to do it on your own. I uh, do you see that as being part of a roadmap? Do you need to get together to make that happen? Is that in any way in the future for you? 
I, I, I think that's kind of a, in my mind, that's a, that's a long-term vision. Um, you know, because go, going and getting an asteroid and bringing it back, that is a multi, likely a multi-billion dollar endeavor. And I think there are some minimum viable product opportunities that we can explore near term uh, using, say, resources that are already on orbit. Uh, so for example, we have several projects where we're looking at capturing and recycling space debris and making new things of value out of them. Um, and there are, you know, there are water resources on the moon. Maybe we can hitch a ride along with some of the CLIPS folks and, and do some demos there. Um, but a as we're developing the capabilities that we're working on now, the, the hydro thrusters, the in-space manufacturing uh, capabilities, we're always trying to push them in a, in a direction so that when in, in situ resources from asteroids or lunar resources or wherever become available, We'll be, we'll be able to ingest those materials into our processes and, and keep moving forward. So, um, yeah, it, you know, that, that's a great long-term vision, but I think there's some, some near-term uh, minimum viable product kind of steps that we can make to, to move there. Ian, you had something? Yeah, so just to, to kind of pick up on that and bring it back to, to a, another theme that we had earlier in the, in the conversation. Uh, Rob, thank you for mentioning the, the debris as a resource uh, issue, because there are some I think there are some near-term opportunities there, but there are some significant government action that needs to be taken to enable some of that. There are some international legal issues around right. ownership yep. and right. permission to... One, the, yeah. like, once you launch something in orbit, it belongs to, to you. you. It's, it's a space object. Yeah. Belongs to, it's the launching state. They exercise yeah. sovereignty. question is, do things that break off, is, if something's yeah. dead up there, things that break off, is that still the launching state space mm -hmm. object? Yeah. Do you need their permission to go and take care of it? Yeah, and um, it's the, not the answered. technology is totally doable. The Techno politics yeah, and the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, insurances. Let's answer that question. So, so I, I think there's, um, it's going to evolve by practice, um, uh, patterns of practice, uh, and the initial kind of bilateral, multilateral agreements. Um, we start with. Um, objects that we know about, we know where they originated. Perhaps we talk to that administration, say we've got this demo thing. If it's not our own, then it's you know if it's another administration's, we say we're going to do this and this, and we get everyone's agreement. And then from there, that kind of way of operating becomes uh, the norm. Uh, but it's not going to be another treaty. It, that's no. a little bit too hard to to get through and uh, uh, in too long term of an outlook for our horizons here. But it's a it's an issue. It's a gating issue um, that best addressed. Like take the easy case first. Do something with the same administration, like yeah. U.S. Uh, space object, a U.S. servicer. Then take a friendly administration, a U.S. Ser servicing yeah. um, a unit with, say, a U.K. space object, yeah. um, and go from there. And so that's a, that's another thing. Because a couple of governments are doing that. So um, JAXA has issued an RFP for. Um, a commercial servicer to remove a piece of Japanese government debris. ESA is considering, you know, the European Space Agency is considering doing the same thing. Uh, in the U.S., I don't even know what agency would be the one that's, that's to do no that. We, yeah. we don't really have a policy authority or even a agency designated to do it's that. Distributed, so it's distributed. Distributed. Yeah. So that's something that the U.S. could think about in the policy context is who has a research and um, oversight function for, for, for the debris issues. Um, so I I'll uh, pick up on a couple of threads here. Um, the first one is is reusing um, material that's already in orbit. Uh, in our economic models of, of supplying spacecraft with propellant, uh, we include the idea of sucking the propellant out of the tanks of a spacecraft that is no longer able to use its own thruster. Uh, and that can dramatically improve the economics of deorbiting spacecraft that have, have uh, lost that functionality. Um, so yeah, that's that's I think the first resource that is in satellites uh, and in the space junk that can be reused is the propellant that's inside their tank. Um, to, uh, to then pick a second thread, go to directly to the asteroid uh, type work and having uh, run Deep Space Industries, an asteroid mining company, uh, for a few years we recognized the first material that is going to be useful off the asteroid is propellant. Um, I make no, uh, um, you know, I don't try and hide the fact that, that Orbit Fab is building gas stations in space to create a market for that propellant. For me this is step two on a, on a long path to asteroid mining. Um, this step, like the last one, is intended to be uh, quite profitable, and uh, we see mm -hmm. the asteroid mining as being a fair way off still. There's about six more steps in between Orbit Fab and asteroid mining. 
uh, come and chat to me if you want to know uh, what those other <laughs> steps are. But um, even if we had an asteroid in Earth orbit in a nicely accessible place, we don't know how to get the material out of it. We don't know how to process it. We can't use that. It might spark some great research, but it's going to be a while until that material becomes commercially available and, uh, and even companies like Orbit Fab are able to use it for, uh, for the propellant supply out of it. Um, so you know, that's not something that's immediately useful, but would be great to be doing science on. Thanks, everyone. Uh, other questions? On a lighter note, how many lawyers... Can you start with your hey. name? Sorry. Oh, my name is Steve Garfine, representing KISSF Aerospace and Defense. How many lawyers does it take to bring an asteroid into low Earth orbit? <laughs> well, if it's a Perkins Coie lawyer, only one. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> There, there has been agreement in the ISS partners in order to take many objects and put them into one object. And I think it was a fairly laborious uh, process. Uh, yes, exactly. And that's a precedent, I think. Uh, it's not, it's because it was two uh, government objects to government objects, it, they ne weren't necessarily involving um, privately owned uh, things. I, I think it's only a precedent, not necessarily um, something that's duplicable, but it is actually makes the subsequent steps easier. I think that is something that the entities, the parties will reference um, and, and perhaps use uh, as a resource in coming to an agreement in this space. Yeah. And in that case, though, different laws apply in different modules. Uh, uh, yes. Different modules, you have you under a different legal regime. Right. Now, here, I think in the near term, we're not talking about kind of doing things inside what we could talk, call the territorial space. We're talking about combining two masses into one mass in space. So I think that's an easier legal and liability question to address. I think the longer term on the space manufacturing issue, when you're talking about additive manufacturing, other things in space, it's a more complex question and it's even more applicable as a precedent. Other questions over there? Uh, Earl White from Draper Labs. Is the movement of of uh, ComSats to LEO hurting the immediate business case for on over servicing? Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, it, it'll change what in servicing, the initial in servicing services may be. Um, having spent the first half of my career working on uh, deorbit capabilities. And, and trying to put together business models for that and running conjunction analyses and that sort of thing. Um, I look at the prospect of Amazon, SpaceX, and OneWeb putting up you know, 15,000 satellites in near polar LEO, both with terror and with glee. Um, I think that there's going to be real opportunity, if, if they do that, there's gonna be real opportunities there for cleanup services to keep uh, the debris problem from getting totally out of hand. Um, I also think that there are opportunities for uh, building things in, in low Earth orbit that can provide similar capabilities to these many thousand uh, constellations, but can do so with several, you know, 12 to 24 platforms that you would assemble on orbit. So I, there are different ways of skinning that cat. Now, I'll just, just add to that, I mean, in, the, in our membership in Confers, we have several companies who are full, you know, almost solely focused on those opportunities to provide end of life services to those constellations as their initial market, right? So that it's creating a type of servicing in and of itself. Um, I do think the LEO constellations play into the dynamic of what's happening in the geo um, comes that market in terms of competition and what Rob was referring to a little bit earlier about the uh, competing terrestrial services now you have to competing Leo services and so how the overall geocomsat market evolves uh, is tied into that uh, certainly a little bit other questions I'd, li I'd like to kind of go back to the, the asteroid <laughs> question. Um, 
part, part of the conundrum or, or challenge that we have to work out is that to, to stand up a, a sustainable economy in space, you need to bring up the whole supply chain in, in unison, both the supply side and the demand side. So even if DSI or P Planetary or uh, anybody else had been able to go get a big asteroid and bring it back, the business case still wouldn't have, cl have closed unless there was an industrial base stood up there ready to ingest that amount of material and pay for it. Um, so I, I think the approach that we're taking right now with you know, Orbit Fab developing propellant depots, we're, we and other folks are working on servicing vehicles, refueling vehicles, platforms, that sort of thing. I think if we start small and kind of bring them up together, we can create that, that whole supply chain in a, in a sustainable manner. Thanks, Rob. So I would like to close the session, but I have a, one final question for the panelists. So when we were doing our OSAM studies, one of the things we found was uh, that the, the OSAM effort is pretty scattered. It's fragmented, you know, com in the company, I mean, obviously there's, there's some amount of collaboration, but there isn't a coherent plan going forward for, for OSAM for the United States. So the question I have, and I would like to go with Stephanie on downward, do you think there is need for an OS a national comprehensive OSAM strategy? And you can say yes or no, you can s give a reason or, or not a reason and just say you're done. Uh, yes, in order to coordinate all the government actors involved, um, as we've discussed. I would say yes, but along those lines, focused on how these OSAM technologies transition into the key, you know, tenant customers, um, trying to incentivize the, uh, the big science and national defense uh, programs to, uh, to, to, to start adopting these new and very different ways of doing business. Okay. Ian? Yes. Yes, for the reasons already mentioned. Dan? No. Ah. All right. I think Ooh. that there is an economic imperative here, and it's going to happen anyway. Now, if the US government wants to capitalize on that in an efficient way, then yes, for the US government, for those purposes. But as soon as this capability becomes available, it's going to change how everybody sees their businesses, and everybody's going to have to have it on the commercial side. And it will follow then that everyone's going to have to have it on the government side. If there's no coordinated central planning policy, then it'll get picked up ad hoc. Uh, if there is, then perhaps it'll get, get pushed through and there'll be a, a more concerted effort to create a, a national capability. But I don't think that that's a prerequisite for what we're doing. Well, if, if the US wants to be a leader in this capability, uh, then yes. If, if we're happy to buy it from other countries, then, then no. Well, you hear, heard it here, folks. Uh, please join me in thanking our awesome panel and